Ladies and gentlemen, Banal of America Audio, with your host, Tim Banal. Hello out there, my friends. This is Tim Banal of BanalofAmerica.com with another edition of Banal of America Audio. It is February 25th, 2006. This week, we have a monstrous interview for you. When I first launched Banal of America Audio, I wanted Lauren Coleman on the show. And finally, the stars have aligned. And Lauren Coleman is here this week on Banal of America Audio. I'm totally psyched for Lauren Coleman to be on the show this week, folks, because I am a lifelong Bigfoot enthusiast. Before I even got into UFOs, I was into studying the Bigfoot, so to finally have a chance to speak with Lauren Coleman after having read his books and heard him on the radio numerous times, it was just a learning experience for me personally, and hopefully it will be for all of you. We discuss cryptozoology inside and out. All kinds of cryptozoological beasts and various ponderances from me. Uh, questions that I have never heard Lauren Coleman asked and try to uh, get inside his head. And then, as if that's not enough, we discuss Lauren Coleman's book, The Copycat Effect, which is about how the media influences popular culture through over-coverage of stories. And so we do both sides of Lauren Coleman and we discuss how he balances being both uh, the world's leading cryptozoologist and one of the world's most respected speakers on the topic of suicide, suicide clusters, and media influence on popular culture. It's an amazing discussion, and it's this week on Banal of America Audio. Let's talk a little bit about Lauren Coleman before we kick off the interview. He's one of the world's leading cryptozoologists, started his field work and investigations in 1960 after traveling and trekking extensively in pursuit of cryptozoological mysteries. Coleman began writing to share his experiences in 1969. Since then, he's written 17 books and more than 300 articles. He's appeared frequently on radio and television programs and has lectured throughout North America, as well as in London and at Loch Ness. He's been both on- and off-camera consultant to Unsolved Mysteries on NBC, Ancient Mysteries on A&E, In Search of History on the History Channel, In the Unknown on Discovery Channel, and other reality-based programs. He contributes cryptozoological columns on the trail to the London-based magazine Fortean Times and Mysterious World to Fate Magazine, as well as regular articles to The Anomalist and Fortean Studies. He has also written extensively in Human Services, having authored, co-authored, or edited eight books, including the critically acclaimed Suicide Clusters, appeared on The Larry King Show to discuss it, and his work on the suicides of baseball players was covered in Sports Illustrated, Sporting News, ESPN, ESPN Classics, and all the major media and wire services. So he's got a one-two punch, cryptozoology and copycat effect. This week on Banal of America Audio, the interview was conducted on January 23, 2006. Lauren Coleman on Banal of America Audio. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of Banal of America Audio. I'm really psyched to have as the guest this week, Lauren Coleman. He is literally tops in the field of cryptozoology. I'd say he's the father of modern day cryptozoology, if you will. Um, so it's it's pretty rare that I get the opportunity to speak to someone who's at the top of the field. So I'm really excited, and I've been a lifelong seeker of the Bigfoot. So for me, it's even better because I've just been fascinated with Bigfoot my whole life, even before I got into UFOs, so to speak with Lauren Coleman is just an honor and a privilege. And ladies and gentlemen, Lauren Coleman, welcome to the show. Great. Great to be here, Tim. Uh, why don't you tell me a little bit about your background and how you ended up uh, getting into uh, the entire cryptozoology realm, because obviously people ask me all the time how I got into this, and, and that's fascinating, and you're so out there and, and, and popular and, and you're such a, like a star in, in the esoteric world that I haven't really heard your background, even though I've heard you on the radio a lot. Yeah. Oh, well, it, it really started for me in 1960. I was 12 years old, and I had really envisioned myself growing up to become a zoologist or study animals in some way, in some fashion. I had my own home zoo. Uh, I grew up in the Midwest in Illinois, and so I had all kinds of, uh, you know, mammals and snakes and turtles and, and different things. I'd gather some of them during the summer and have this huge backyard zoo 
and then at the end of the summer release them back in the wild and start all over again. Oh, wow. Uh, the ones that I, you know, like were mammals and uh, like hamsters, things like that, I would bring inside, of course. Yeah. Anyway, I was uh, doing all of that, very interested in science, a uh, bright student in school and all of that, and all of a sudden, one night in March, I saw a fiction film, a science fiction film really called Half Human, and it was done by the same director, Hondo, I found out later, who went on to do Godzilla and did Rodan and all of those famous movies. But just before he had done this movie in 1957 in Japan, he had been a documentary filmmaker. So when he made Half Human, it looked to me, even as a 12-year-old, like a documentary. It talked about these native peoples uh, in the mountains who were reporting a thing they called the snowman. And uh, then it showed these Westerners, uh, David Carradine. Uh, yeah, yeah. His father, John Carradine, was in it as a character actor, as they often did back then for movies they brought over to America. Anyway, they looked for the abominable snowman. They finally captured and killed a, a young one and put it on a table, did all the examinations. And as chance would have it back to reality of me watching the TV show, that show was rebroadcast again on a Saturday morning, the next Saturday morning. So I actually got a double dose of brainwashing. <laughs> And then I went to school the next week, and I said, what is this about the abominable snowman? And almost to a one, every one of my teachers said, don't waste your time. Don't read anything about this. Yeah. You know, all of that stuff. So what did I do? I went to the library and got everything I could on the abominable snowman and the Yeti and found out there was something here. It was one of those. I had been at the time already reading the books of Charles Fort, the Book of the Damned, and all of those. So I was kind of questioning authority and questioning all of these higher scientific commitments to only looking one way and not the other. So I just got more and more into it and found very quickly that there were reports of Black Panthers in Illinois. I found out about Bigfoot. Um, I uh, found that Ivan Sanderson in 1961 wrote a book called Abominable Snowman Legend Comes to Life. I wrote him Altogether, probably, uh, I think it was by the time I was 14, I had 400 correspondents around the world. Oh, wow. I was already out in the field doing field work, uh, going with game wardens, investigating cases. Oh, wow. Um, you know, writing and gathering material. So, so much so that Ivan Sanderson, who was one of my correspondents at the time, thought I was like in my 50s. <laughs> <laughs> so I just uh, got more deeply into it and just one decision I would make after another would be based upon my interest in cryptozoology. I finally, when I went to uh, college, I mean, I, my father and my father was a professional firefighter. My mother was a housewife and, you know, basically a working class family struggling and I, I, I needed to go to a state school. So I picked out a state school, Southern Illinois University, because they had a long folklore tradition around there of little apes in the woods. Huh. And actually went down there and studied anthropology, graduated with a degree in anthropology and zoology. And so that, you know, one, and then I, uh, I decided to move to California and I moved to California for a couple of years to do some investigations there. Uh, in the meantime, I was traveling all the time. I was hitchhiking. I was getting in my car. And by now, it's 45 years later and I've been to every state in the United States except Alaska. And I've lived in uh, the Midwest and in, in the West and uh, now in New England since 1975. Wow. So, uh, you know, just one late thing led to another. Yeah. And, uh, and I wrote my first article, I think it was 1969, my first book in 75. So I've gone from field work to investigative work to uh, chronicling the, the situation as well as, like you say, uh, you know, to some people a media star, which I hardly think about. <laughs> it, it does happen, and, and yet I still do field work, and actually the media seems to be one of the major sources of funding these days because documentary film companies can fly you into areas that you, you hardly can afford to go to anymore. Yeah. Now, uh, the first uh, like big, big picture sort of question I have for you, because you know the Bigfoot as, as well as anybody, if money were no object, how would you go about uh, capturing the Bigfoot? Well, I think that... Uh, we need to really refocus our brain in terms of the way that new animals are always discovered. And they're always discovered by knowing the local wildlife and also knowing the local people. 
And so what I would do with, uh, you know, millions of dollars of funding, I would set up groups of two or three people in different pocketed areas, wilderness areas around the country, just like, you know, rethink the Diane Fossey and the Jane Goodall model, yeah. which was uh, Louis Leakey's uh, really, they were... Uh, they were the women that he would send out. I mean, he talked to all of these women about, we need to know more about primates and the great apes so that we can understand prehistoric man. And I think that's exactly the key to animal collecting or collecting information. So then I would pick out certain areas in Northern California and uh, British Columbia and the UK, Yukon and, and really and find some people that uh, want to do Survivor for six months or eight months. Yeah, it's not going to happen with a bunch of weekend warriors that are, have all of the technology in the world and all of the high tech equipment. I think it's really going to be low tech and somebody smelling like a, you know, a skunk after they come out. But at least that's the way the other animals in the area won't notice them, and Bigfoot will come closer. Yeah, yeah. So you just can be patient, pretty much, and sure, and situated in the environment. Right. Exactly. Now. Uh now, if I recall correctly from your book, you fall on the side of the no-kill uh, sort of debate within the Bigfoot world. Uh, if we're if we're going to get close enough to it in a situation, um, do you take it down or not? And you're you're on the not side, correct? Yeah, I mean, I don't even think about it as a debate anymore. I think it's just if you look at what happened during the turn of the century during Victorian times, to the, between the the 19th and 20th century. That was the obvious way to collect animals. You could go out and you shoot a bunch of them and you, you figure out which ones are the new ones. But we know now the animal populations are so low and if there, you know, if there is a Bigfoot out there or Yeti out there, the numbers, the breeding population in any one area is going to be so small, you won't want to kill one. And so that's where I do think that we need to rely on high technology. Uh, and a friend of mine, Mark Hall, actually calls it telebiology where you do capture, you know, and then release. But you you capture one of these creatures, you photograph them, you take blood samples, DNA, uh, you observe them for a long amount of time, maybe even setting up a, a reservation, a preserve, a habitat. This is like a living zoo that may be hundreds and hundreds of acres and then release them into that with, uh, you know, a microchip in so you can track them and all of that. Yeah. But uh, I think it's really, I've often said in a joking but somewhat serious way, that maybe we will discover Bigfoot when a lumber truck in Maine hits one or a yeah. lumber truck in British Columbia. And, and so I'm not against obviously taking advantage of the fact that accidents do occur, that uh, animals are killed, that animals die naturally, and maybe we'll find a body and we should take that. But I am... And I actually think that these creatures, uh, these cryptids, have higher senses of smell and some other factors where they don't really, that they actually avoid guns and gun oil and different things like that. So guns tend to get in the way of hunting Bigfoot as opposed to helping. Yeah. Now, last year I read an article that was uh, about how there's this, this East Coast versus West Coast uh, Bigfoot researcher feud, if you will. Uh, you probably know the article I was talking about. I think it was in the Washington Post or the New York Post or the New York yeah. Times, one of those. Yeah. Um, is that an extenuation, you think, of the ongoing, continuing uh, generational feuds that seem to erupt over uh, the, big, the search for Bigfoot? Well, I think if you find any anomalous field, and if you look at Bigfoot and uh, Bondable Snowman and uh, you know, cryptozoology, you will find different divisions. For one thing, I think, and I believe that was the Post, had that article in there mainly to create a media sensation. I think the media is always looking for friction, yeah. always looking for an angle. So if you look at most of the new people that are involved, uh, you know, even newer than me, obviously, uh, they're coming out of the East Coast. Ohio and some of the other states out east have high populations of new researchers. Some of the older, the you know, the four horsemen like uh, Peter Byrne and John Green and Rene de Hendon and uh, Grover Krantz, those all were Western individuals. Ivan Sanderson once told me in 1965, I was the only person in the East that was digging up Eastern cases. Yeah. So if you if I look back at it and think you know 65 to now. You know, 
40 years later, there's obviously going to be a lot of new people, and I've produced a lot of articles, and other people have, of course, so that more and more people get involved. But you know, I, I do think that the, the thing that goes on with the Western researchers, because they're not open to the data from the East, they tend to think this is one species, this is one concentrated population in the Pacific Northwest, and that everybody else is hallucinating, and they really aren't finding footprints. And it, In other words, all of the criticisms that they hear from regular scientists in the media uh, about their West Coast Bigfoot, they then lump on into the same debunking that they give out for the East Coast. So yeah. it, it's kind of an uh, intriguing trend to see. But uh, I have friends on both, co both coasts, and I really feel like, you know, I don't want to be in this feud, but it does occasionally... <laughs> It does occasionally happen that uh, the big symposium, for instance, at Willow Creek, uh, at a certain point after I was invited to go and speak, then the local Chamber of Commerce and some other local funders decided this was only going to be open to West Coasters. So there can be things that are set up that just creates additional fiction. Friction. Yeah. Now, like you were saying about how the West Coast seems to think that it's just one pocket of species, in your book you, you point out that you think it might be, uh, a, I want to say, three species of Bigfoot. Is that, is that about right? Yeah, I, th I think that um, types is a, a word that I, I'm much more comfortable with. Okay. For instance, the Eastern Bigfoot, or the, the Mark Common, as I sometimes call it, or, or as the Native people sometimes use the one word, Wendigo, there may be actual geographic races, differences between the West and the East Coast Bigfoot, per se. I do think that there's a, a vastly different species, a much more chimpanzee going around on all fours, smaller, smells much more in the South, that uh, really is, is dramatically shown by the name skunk ape in Florida. Yeah. And I think that that population is really very much a different species than the uh, Bigfoot. Yeah. But I do think that Bigfoot's an ape. Uh, it's just an ape that's uh, evolved in a different way than most uh, great apes have today. Okay. Now, this is uh, this is kind of intriguing. Uh, usually, when I have a guest coming up for the show, I email the two, uh, two of the writers from my website and ask if they have questions. Almost always, they never have any questions, but this time, each of them had a question. So. Oh, great. Yeah. So, I want to um, take care of those, make sure I take care of uh, these questions right away. Um, first is Leslie. Uh, you might you might be familiar with Leslie. She has the Debris Field blog. Uh, yeah. She writes for us on Tuesdays. Um, she wanted to know about, uh, she heard a story about a year ago about uh, giant bears around Siberia, and she wanted to know if you knew anything about that. Yeah, there's a speculation in Siberia that uh, one of the Pleistocene, you know, the last ice age, uh, giant bears, which are related to the brown bears except a little bit bigger, do exist. And there's hunter folklore from up there that does uh, does talk about those. And I do mention in my book Cryptozoology A to Z. So there does seem to be to be some areas in Siberia that has good wilderness, good uh, you know uh, a kind of distance from human habitat where we would expect some possibility bears would exist like that. Okay. And now the other writer is uh, Chiron. He's uh, Michael is his real name, but he goes by Chiron and. And he writes for uh, Chiron.net and BenallOfAmerica.com. And he, he actually, he's done a lot of covering of a lot of the stuff that you were involved with with the uh, thing last October. And then he also covers a lot of cryptozoology um, and that giant squid story that, that came about uh, last sure. year. And he wants to know, in light of the, uh, the, the recent news with the giant squid, what's left to be done in the hunt for, for Bigfoot or Nessie? Uh, like, where's, where's cryptozoology going next? Where does it need to go next? Well, first of all, there's, I think there's a little misunderstanding about the giant squid story. The giant squid, of course, were discovered and verified in the 1870s. And what the, the media kind of messed up on was saying that all of this giant squid, like the giant squid has never been verified as an animal before and has been part of cryptozoology. But the, the videotapes that the Japanese took last year are really the news that they announced that they'd taken them the year before were the first live videotapes of 
giant squid. We knew the giant squid existed. So uh, it's interesting to see how exciting people can, how excited people can get when they just hear about the live footage yeah. of the coelacanth, which was discovered in 1938, the giant fish that's blue off of the coast of South Africa that supposedly was extinct uh, for 65 million years, but now we know did uh, were not. They were only videotaped in the 1990s, and that once again was an exciting. A uh, bit of news. So every time we discover an animal doesn't necessarily mean that we know what they look like live in the wild. And that's why I think the li- the giant squid story was so famous. Yeah. I think that, uh, well, at the end of every year I, I do predictions of, I'm, I mean, not predictions, but an overview of the stories for the year. And I also mentioned that uh, there's sightings of the, I, of the, uh, a relative of the ivory, ivory bird. Ivory billed woodpecker, which is the imperial woodpecker of Mexico. I have a feeling we may have more woodpecker stories out this year. There's uh, news and excitement coming out of new expeditions for Mokilio Mbembe to Africa this year. That's another area that kind of has been quiet for a while. It is following intriguingly on the heels of news during. 2005, that four individuals that were closely related to the Mokilio Mbembe, which is supposedly the dinosaur that lives in the Congo, yeah. the Cameroons, uh, that they died during the year, and yet here's just once again you're seeing the mantle from a whole generation of Mokilio Mbembe hunters being uh, passed on to a younger generation uh, of people that are on expedition right now in, in the Cameroons. That, the, the ape uh, stories from uh, Africa, I think, could uh, really stimulate something. And once again, I don't think we should ever uh, sell Bigfoot short. There's the uh, Sasquatch Dumpling Gang movie coming out this year. Yeah. Done by the same people that did Napoleon Dynamite. Oh, really? Yeah, and it's it's going to be a funny comedy. It's already getting good reviews. It's at some of the festivals out west already. But what I notice is there's oftentimes... Uh, If there's something happening in the popular art culture, then you'll get news uh, on the real basis. We've got the the, at Bates University, we're going to have the big uh, cryptozoology exhibition occurring this year, then moving to Kansas. I think that will stimulate interest. Uh, The photo competition for the dual masters photos, that ends in February 2006. We're probably going to hear about uh, what those photographs showed. Uh, and then Disney down in uh, Disney World is opening their new Yeti exhibit. Oh, wow. So, uh, you know, just all those little things tend to then, at least in North America, get people looking around and talking about Bigfoot and, yeah. and moving out into the woods. So it could be an exciting year. Awesome. Awesome. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, that whole adventure uh, from last October? Um, with the $1 million bounty on Bigfoot that was put out um, by, I think, the company you said earlier, too, right? The yeah, Dual Masters, Wizards of the Coast, uh, Hasbro Company. Well, what happened, of course, was uh, they had an idea that the Dual Masters is a, a trading card game for uh, youngsters in the 13 to 15-year-old age, mostly males, but also I think all kinds of different people play those games. Yeah. And they have, some of them have monsters on them and some of them are, are creations that are close to the monsters. So their whole, it, it's, it's a very big phenomena in Japan. And the dual masters people are interested in, in stimulating some interest in the United States. So they had an idea early in October and they were going to release the news late in October that they were going to put out a one million dollar bounty for a picture of the Loch Ness monster, a Yeti or Bigfoot that would lead to the capture of one of these. So uh, it was going to be the kind of thing that that they felt, and they started, their lawyers started reading what, I guess, the other part of the company had put out as a a test floater. And they started understanding that there might be people killed out in the woods trying to shoot uh, Bigfoot or capture Bigfoot when that's not what the contest was about. It was about a photograph. Yeah. So... um, and they had hired me uh, to assist them with the, you know, coming up with the right kind of language and different things like that. Mm-hmm. 
and given me permission to release that news at a couple of conferences in Texas and uh, at Bates College in Maine late in October. So when it came closer to that, they uh, the lawyers really made them withdraw the the one million dollars, but they put out nine thousand dollars in real prizes that are actually guaranteed to be given away. And and all the top prize, for instance, uh, and these are all about the photographs of anything that would could be used to convince that someone or show as evidence of Bigfoot, Yeti, or the Loch Ness Monster. So, you know, you can't do any Photoshopping, you can't do any yeah. computer enhancement. But they, I think that what will happen is some people are going to send in photographs of a Bigfoot prints or of habitat where they think that there's a Bigfoot. And it's it's going to be interesting because they're, they are giving away the prize and, and I actually am going to be on one of, on the panel yeah. to uh, to judge it, and it won't be the kind of thing where we're going to give prizes for you know your grandmother's second relative dressing up in a <laughs> a gorilla costume. It's got to be something that really enhances cryptozoology. Now you see some of the stuff that's coming in already, or are they hold on no, that. No, they hold on that until uh, the contest ends February third. That's a good thing though that they're giving all that kind of money, and that probably generates, like you said, a lot of interest in people. Yeah, I, I think they're they're rightfully using the word cryptozoologist in training, and it's uh, it is it is amazing to me to watch. I just did a lecture this week to a group of second and third graders, and I I don't do that very often, but it was uh, something that a local person wanted to do, and uh, and you know there a lot of people are interested in cryptozoology, and their parents may be afraid that that's going to ruin their life and they'll be interested in computers and games and cryptozoology all their life. And I don't see that happening at all. I see cryptozoology as a gateway to learning about animals and the environment and and really changing some people's lives away from just not being interested in anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, and now during that time when the story came out, you were uh – that was when uh, I remember we were trying to set up the interview in the first place. You sounded like you were just inundated with uh, media inquiries. What was that like uh, to be all of a sudden thrust into into that sort of situation? Yeah, that was a that was pretty interesting. I remember one Wednesday I had uh, 23 radio interviews and and magazine interviews in one day. Went down to Texas and got interviewed by uh, 11 news crews. You know, CNN, ESPN2. Uh, you know, a lot of local media, a lot of uh, national media. So that that happens occasionally during what I call media flaps. And the last one was when the Mothman movie came out, and I consulted to that. That was 2002. But what's what's happened since October is it's not stopped. Oh wow! With, with the most, and that's one of the reasons we've had such a hard time. Is I've, you know, I've been flown okay. out flown out to G4 uh, TV in LA and been on. Uh, been on that show, uh, the attack of the show, and, yeah. and I've been uh, on weird, weird, weird travels on the Travel Channel. They came by. The Boston Globe magazine is going to do a profile on cryptozoology. Uh, Down East Mag- you know, I, one thing after another, it's uh, been nonstop, and uh, I, there's not a week that goes by when I don't do two or three interviews. Oh man. It's just, And then, in addition, I'm trying to write books and you know investigate cases. And, yeah. And take care of my uh, my family too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't become too big a celebrity because the esoteric world needs you. We can't, oh, we I'm can't not... lose you to some you know reality show or sitcom. Oh no, I'm not leaving. Okay. Um, now, uh, one of the things that always intrigued me was uh, around the '90s when DNA all of a sudden became like a reliable scientific source. Um, there were starting to come in some DNA samples what we thought were of Bigfoot, and uh, they were always like unknown primate situations. Yeah. Has there ever been uh, a study, or has anyone taken a look at these DNA samples and tried to compare them, or contra, uh, you know, try and create some kind of database, maybe find some comparisons, uh, and come up with some sort of standard in a way? Well, well, first of all, I think people got very excited by DNA and saw it as a magic key to understand new animals. But you have to back up first, and one reason we keep getting uh, inconsistent. Uh, you know, results or looks like human but is not quite human or in, inconsistent near near ape is that until we have a type specimen of a Bigfoot, 
uh, of a Yeti, of any of these creatures, we're going to have all these hair samples, even some with uh, usable DNA roots, and they're not going to tell us a darn thing because we don't have the type animal. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's sort of, you know, and that's true with criminal forensic, you know, CSI kind of stuff, is you can have all of this evidence you want, but if you don't have the evidence from the criminal, from the human, then it's worthless. And that's what I think a lot of the debunkers and skeptics jumped on early on when DNA came out, because we do have hair. We do have, you know, I, I myself have hair from the 1950s and, and 60s from the uh, Yeti expeditions to the Himalayas. And, uh, but we, until we have an animal, they're really worthless, because all they keep coming back as not human, but near human. Yeah. And it doesn't tell us a thing. As far as the um, the other part of your question, is there organizations try to compare those? Yes. Uh, there's uh, Henner, you know, Fernbach, who's out uh, on the West Coast, has been a, a major force in collecting samples of hair. And he, like, I mean, I, I do a very minor part of it compared to him. He has a great, he used to be connected to one of the national primate centers in the country before he retired. So he has samples from all kinds of monkeys and apes and, and humans from around the world, as well as people tend to send him Bigfoot air samples. I have samples of, of Yeti and Bigfoot and, you know, chimpanzee, orangutan, different gorilla, so, as well as, you know, all of the common yeah. domestic animals. But it's been very funny during the 1950s on one of the Tom Swick expeditions in California uh, they started getting hair samples, and they were in an area where these animals didn't exist, uh, not the Yeti, but the one that they found out these samples were of, and it was of a moose. Huh. Uh, um, and and so you know that you had some actual fakery and hoaxing going on. Yeah. And in the recent story from just last year of what was called, the, you know, the Bigfoot sample from Yukon yeah. that, that got all of the news, and it turned out to be a bison. And uh, I talked to the scientist that was involved in the analysis of that, and it wasn't just a, a regular sample of bison hair. He said this was a, a bison hair that had been taken from a rug, huh. as he could tell from the process. Oh, man. So somebody had take the, taken a tanned rug of a bison and actually faked uh, that that hair sample. So some people go to all kinds of lengths because they think it's a great laugh to hoax other people, but it tends to end up a, a complete waste of all of our time. Yeah. So like, uh, like you said, that uh, the person up there in California, but they're comparing, like what I'm interested in is sort of like you get the unknown uh, primate, unknown but not human. Right. Has it, and he's compared them to each other, so like... Uh, right. Are there any matches, sort of, in a way? Do you know what I mean? Is there like yeah, there, there's some uh, overall matches. That's why you'll hear from some of the West Coaster, Coasters who who got a new hair sample, and they say it's consistent with other Bigfoot hair that we've found oh, okay. before. Yeah. And this is not through DNA. This is mostly through microscopic structural uh, comparison. Yeah. And there are some consistencies that are coming out, but that's also, as opposed to going to the very expensive DNA analysis, a lot of the comparison with and finding of hoaxes is just you can almost immediately look at some of the structure of these hair and, and see that they're, uh, I mean, one of the most common things is people take it from hairbrushes. Oh, man. From the bristles. So there's camel hair showing up. There's, you know, some exotic furs that aren't even a, of animals that exist in the United States. Oh. And that's because people are uh, doing that kind of stuff. Okay, now, uh, let's take a look into the future. Let's say Bigfoot's captured, okay? Does that hurt uh, cryptozoology in the long run? Because I know, like, once Bigfoot's captured, then he's in the in the world of the zoology. He's no longer a crypto. Um, right. Do you think the field of cryptozoology will uh, be hurting once it loses Bigfoot? Oh, not at all. I think that uh, it will be justification for further funding, and I can, I can hear the people on their TV shows already talking about that. And I, I think if you look at it in a minor sort of way, uh, the discovery of the ivory-billed woodpecker after 60 years, the discovery of the little people from Flores, the hobbits, as the media yeah. likes to call them, yeah. those have actually made cryptozoology, uh, or as uh, Henry Glee of Nature Magazine, the editor of Nature Magazine, he said cryptozoology can kind of finally come in from the cold. 
And I think that's what's happening. Actually, cryptozoology right now is getting more substantially uh, recognized as a science that needs to be treated seriously. And I saw that last uh, summer, I mean, last October at the Bates College Symposium on art and cryptozoology. Here you had academics, as opposed to debating whether or not cryptozoology is worthwhile, they were talking about the history of cryptozoology and how uh, how cryptozoology influences different sciences and involves and informs art. And that's a, a really a, a whole new status for cryptozoology as opposed to as opposed to it being talked about as a pseudoscience, it's actually being talked as Heuvelmans and Sanderson and myself have wanted for many years that this is a sub-discipline of zoology. It may be a little more strange for some academics to deal with, but it certainly uh, is based upon very thoughtful science. Now, do you think that gives uh, that gives hope for maybe some of the other more uh, esoteric sciences out there, like ufology and um, some... Uh, mostly ufology, really, but some of the other uh, fringe science specializations. If cryptozoology is getting some respect, finally, do you think that that might, down the line, open up the doors for other areas? Um, I think it's a mixed bag, and I think one of the things that's been important for cryptozoology is to really separate itself from something like ufology. Yeah. I, I think that parapsychology, for instance, has done a very good job of coming up with uh, results that are very measurable, and that's sort of why at some universities there are very serious courses on parapsychology. But the problem with ufology, uh, m- mostly, and I think it's like if you uh, ask somebody that purely studies uh, ghosts and not some of the other things like poltergeist, is that ufology studies of ghosts, studies of uh, telepathy, uh, although that's that's a little different. They, they're they very like wisps of smoke, yeah. and it's hard to say, are there people out there, uh, you know, did Roswell happen? Are, are there men in black? Are there UFOs? Those are so um, paranormal and uh, without what Ivan Sanderson used to call the tangible intangibles, it's hard to get a grasp on, on them. Whereas cryptozoology, which really sees itself as coming out of zoology, we look for hair samples, yeah. body, footprints, uh, you know, as well as folk art from natives, peoples, traditions that last 350 years, a lot of different things that actually have history, even linguistics. Uh, you know, what this animal is called locally, how is it in the spirit world, how is it in the real world. Uh, you know, you just don't get that kind of texture in ufology. Yeah. Uh, so it, it really seems to be different. And I don't know that uh, cryptozoology becoming more accepted is going to help uh, ufology at all. And, and I don't think that cryptozoologists really worry about that either. Oh, yeah, I know. I'm just asking a sociologist. No, no, of course. no, no I'm, I'm just giving a complete answer. Okay. <laughs> all right. And now, all right, we're still on this post Bigfoot's been captured uh, world okay. here. Uh, what? I uh, think it's going to do some things with religion and anthropology, though, that people haven't quite, um, you know, thought about. Uh, anthropology is going to be stirred up because most anthropologists have grown up in a world in which there have been uh, only one, one human-like creature, and that's us, humans. Yeah. Homo sapiens. As soon as we find another bipedal creature, whether it's a uh, Arangay Pindek over in Sumatra or uh, the Yeti or the Bigfoot, that's going to shake up that science for a little while. What do you mean by what do you mean by religion, though? In, in terms of religion, I think that uh, a lot of religious people um, are so bound up in to human beings and being at the pinnacle or the non-acceptance of evolution, if you discover Bigfoot, it could actually shake up uh, religions that are so rigid they can't accept the possibility that there's evolution or that these people, you know, that they've just been around for uh, the same amount of time as we have. Or even if you get into, then it'll open up all kinds of things about other species over in Asia that may have interbred with humans. And uh, It's just that once you find one of these big, uh, very visible hominids around the world that are existing concurrently with us, it's going to open an amazing can of worms. 
wow, I never really thought about it like that, but you really make, you make some good points there. Um, now, let's, all right, so let's say one's been captured, uh, the Bigfoot. How soon do you think afterwards would it be like if they capture one Bigfoot, the next thing you know they can, they can get them easily? Or is it going to be like they capture one and it's going to take another 50 years before we get another one? Well, if, if our experience with other na- new animals is, is in the indication, it took us 60 years after the discovery of the giant panda to capture the first live one. And then it took, it happened very quickly. You're right, we knew where to go. Uh, but then again, it was it was a few months. If you look at the coelacanth, the first one was uh, found in 1938, and then they didn't find the next one until 1952. Oh, man. So, so sometimes that does happen. If And also the thing about Bigfoot that I, I keep stressing in a lot of talks I give is that our, our being human, our human interactions with Bigfoot is all chance. It's all just by the circumstances that we happen to be in the same area that they happen to be in. We don't really know what their lifestyle is day to day. We don't even know if they exist in the areas that they're being seen. They could be juvenile delinquent interlopers. You know, I, I think that if we look at most of the sightings, they tend to be males that are kind of thin, walking across highways and stuff like that. I think that those are your juvenile those groups of juveniles that are out there, you know, roaming around and cruising. And they aren't the families. They aren't the real established populations. You have to dig into some stories and find when people see two and three and four, and then you might be closer to the areas they're living. But I think that, uh, so back to your original thing, where did we get this, this Bigfoot? Is it along a road? Is it a, a place that there was one book, Bigfoot that was accidentally there? Is that going to help us catch the next one or run into the next one? Yeah. Maybe not, because the one that we see may be somebody that's so out of place and so out of territory that it might take us another 20 years to get the next one. Yeah, like you said, like someone could hit one by accident. Right. And that wouldn't help us and that wouldn't, you know, lead us to any clues on how to search for them. Right. I think the uh, capturing the one and then doing all of the studies and making sure that uh, it's verified and, and, you know, we can get all the funding, and then actually doing the microchip tracker and releasing it and seeing where they go. Oh, yeah. And are they hooking up to, with other ones? Then that's, I think, what's going to teach us more. Yeah. Um, now, kind of speaking to your to your book then, if, if it's sort of dangerous if, if uh, some, like like you said, weekend warriors, if they end up getting a Bigfoot, that could sort of end up being like a copycat effect where uh, they could really hurt the Bigfoot population, do you think? Yeah, I think it it really, the initial thing is who is the person that's really there as the first responder, as the first one to get the Bigfoot? If it's, you know, an accident and it's some housewife coming home from the grocery store in in Durham, Maine, and she hits one, and then uh, she gets in science, scientists and universities and uh, the media, then you're going to have a situation. It will be a circus, but at least it will be a protected sur- circus. Yeah. If you uh, have uh, a well-funded weekend warrior group that goes out and kills one, they're probably going to think, we can make millions of dollars of all, off of this, so we're going to keep it under wraps for a while. We're going to try to find where others are. We're going to line up our agents. We're going to, you know, get a good deal on uh, on today's show and a major yeah. movie deal. And so you'll see it go a whole different route. And I think that's really the difference between who is the person that first has this interaction with this this dead or or a live captured Bigfoot, and then what happens from that. And it could be a very different story. And you, you really saw that uh, uh, somewhat around the ivory-billed woodpecker, the government and the you know Nature Conservatory and different groups like that stepped in when they already knew and they were convinced there was a really an ivory-billed woodpecker. They got funding of over a million dollars. They They bought up houses in the habitat and around the area they were looking for it, kept it quiet for over a year. Oh, wow. And uh, it was the big secret. It was like a a black ops operation. And a lot of people reading about the ivory-billed woodpecker haven't read deeply into the stories to see how the government really actually got involved and actively kept this 
story quiet for, I think, almost 18 months. If that happens with Bigfoot, there's going to be such a reaction from, you know, people who, who are conspiracy-minded anyway. Yeah. And, and it realistically, you'll wonder what the government's doing if they're doing something like that with a, a creature like Bigfoot. Okay, now, um, you're pretty well known in the field for not really, you don't, um, you don't pay much credence to the whole UFO, uh, the paranormal Bigfoot aspects. So you, you don't, uh, you don't think there's any sort of like paradimensional, you think it's just a straight up animal, right? Well, I think, uh, uh, let me, in 1975 and 78, I wrote two books with Jerry Clark, uh, The Unidentified and Creatures of the Outer Edge. And those books during 2006 are going to be republished with a new introduction, which I talk a little bit about this. I think that it's very easy for people to put myself and other individuals in a black and white, you know, either you believe this or you don't believe yeah. this. And my whole notion is that I really explored that question. I I looked at what I call the Jungian uh, collective unconscious, uh, the projections of the planetary poltergeist, that there may be aspects of llama behavior and other individuals who can actually project physical things from their body or make other individuals think that they're seeing something physical. I explored that in those two books. I was satisfied that maybe that was part of what was going on. And instead, after those two books came out, everybody thought uh, in 1978 that I was some kind of believer in paranormal, uh, you know, psychic Bigfoot. Yeah. And that's not exactly what I was saying. <laughs> so I, I found it necessary to go back to my real background, which is anthropology and zoology, as a real firm, nuts and bolts, or flesh and blood, whatever word you want to use, yeah. cryptozoologist. And so most of my pronunciations, most of my insights, most of my tracking knowledge is on the physical Bigfoot and the physical cryptids. It still doesn't mean that I understand that there are some aspects of any of these sightings that could be uh, parapsychological, that could be uh, human psychology. I mean, I do have a degree in psychiatric social work and I've done a lot of doctor work in, in a, those areas and know that part of the problem with any of these sightings is they're not simple. I think that probably 20% of them really are talking about an actual animal. But there's misidentifications, there's mental health problems with some of these eyewitnesses, uh, and maybe there is a, a small, small fraction. But I think that uh, in some of the lectures I've gone to and I had to almost walk out on is where somebody gets up there and they're showing fake footage of a Bigfoot hopping over a fence, and they're trying to say that these Bigfoot are psychic Bigfoot, that they're related to some ancient Mayan tribe, and that they may be related to those people coming out of the UFOs. I just think that really does a disservice to all of those fine people out there doing really in-the-field, conscientious Bigfoot work, yeah. uh, where they're not even thinking about theories. They're just trying to collect information and, and evidence. Since you're sort of like since you're sort of like the go-to guy of the field, and, and everyone seems to turn to you a lot, do you find yourself frustrated dealing with, like you said, the the, uh, the guy showing the video of the Bigfoot hopping the fence or the hoaxers? And uh, we don't, I mean, we don't need to really go into what happened this past summer with the uh, infamous captured Bigfoot, but I mean, <laughs> I'm well, sure you have to uh, you have to come in and, and sort of straighten out all these Bigfoot stories that that come out all the time. That must be frustrating. Well, I think there's a couple things that go on. Those people that they're showing those obviously fake things or they have their trumped up stories, they're not going to seek me out. They're not going to, uh, their egos get in the way of, of what they're doing and they certainly aren't collaborating with me. I collaborate with a lot of people that have credible evidence. It's the media that then comes to me and wants me to talk about uh, that dubious individual there or that one over there. Yeah. And I'm, I, I just say some very simple things about, uh, you know, like with uh, the one book that said that uh, the Roger Patterson film was a fake. You look in that one book and there's two different stories about the one, the skin was from a horse and it had six pieces. And another, the skin was from a carnival guy and it had three pieces. So you can sometimes uh, these individuals uh, hang themselves with 
talking too much. And, and you got to see that this summer with the, uh, the quote-unquote captured Bigfoot in which the individual didn't even – he said on one program he'd seen it, and it came, became very clear very quickly that he hadn't seen it. And now he's around the country trying to, uh, I think uh, – allegedly scammed some other people with some news stories. And it's just, we have to watch out. And we knew about, we've known about some of these people for 30 years, and they've just kind of, they go away for a while and come back. But, you know, they leave track, so to speak. Yeah. I think it's like that in a lot of these esoteric fields, too, that, uh, you know, there's always these people that are sort of more harm than good for the field. Yeah. But most of the people that have had, I mean, I talked to, 15-year-olds and 50-year-olds and 105-year-olds on my through emails all the time and people are, are honestly bringing up their extraordinary experiences and they're not looking to get publicity they're not looking uh, you know and sometimes I do have to honestly say to them well that sounds like it was an owl or <laughs> yeah. uh, you know I bet that was a fisher yeah. which is a type of animal that fools a lot of people. And, you know, people are very open to, to hearing what I say and, and saying, you know, well, that wasn't the Koopa. The chupacabra was a, a, you know, a dog with mange and stuff like that. So everything's not weird out there. Some of it does have mundane expl- explanations. Well, speaking of the chupacabra, this thing seemed to come up in the 90s out of nowhere. Um, was this something that people had been talking about prior to uh, the last 15 years, or is it pretty much a new crypto animal? Well, no, it's it's one of those things uh, where we have the media to thank for that. It, it very much, there's a, a Hispanic Oprah, and I believe her name is Christina. Okay. She, has a, she has a program, and in 1995, she had a whole couple programs about the chupacabras being seen in in a Puerto Rico, and they were killing deer and goats and and all of that kind of you know livestock. Yeah. And that jumped over the cultural barrier between uh, Spanish and English, and that was the key to it. Uh, within the Hispanic culture, the chupacabras has been around for a long time. Oh, really? And actually, um, actually, recently, uh, together with some other associates, we discovered that there's a I believe it's in uh, the early, the late 1960s or 70s. We're trying to date this exactly. There was an episode of Bonanza in which a Mexican worker was uh, on the Cartwright Ranch, and he was talking about this creature, the chupacabras, which was uh, killing livestock. And so you had this chupacabra story around for a long, long time. It just uh, got to be the right time in 1995 because of the internet. Because what happened is after Christina's show, Hispanic students all across the United States started creating websites. Yeah. And it was that, the internet, uh, that really pushed along the chupacabra into the English speaking. And like I've said, uh, it reminds me of Jennifer Lopez. You know, she's, it's just a cultural thing and very <laughs> cross-cultural. Yeah. We all know how much we're interested in Jennifer Lopez. So. <laughs> Well, uh, obviously, do you think you're going to see the capture of Bigfoot in your lifetime? You probably get that question constantly. So what, what do you think? Well, if I live 25 years, I think that it's the kind of thing that uh, I've, I have mentioned the words passion and patience are the two watchwords of cryptozoology. And, uh, you know, within 25 years, I figure if we look at it took uh, – 60, 70 years to find the first giant panda alive. It took that long to find the first mountain gorilla. And if you date the modern era of Bigfoot from 1958, when the name was given, when Jerry Crew found those famous footprints at Bluff Creek, then we're really still kind of getting into the September, October of Bigfoot. Yeah. And uh, I don't think I need to worry yet. Uh, what I'm most interested in is making sure there's open-minded cryptozoologists after I leave. And uh, yeah. that's why I, I like to popularize and write about cryptozoology. And, you know, I have that new blog of mine called Crypto Mundo, yeah. which uh, really I try to keep it, keep people updated with the news uh, quite regularly about what's going on in cryptozoology. 
Now, uh, what about the Loch Ness Monster? It seems to have kind of lost a lot of steam in the last, uh, like, 15, 20 years. Is this sort of kind of like what you're saying with the media? Like, they'll pick up on it again in another few years, and it'll be like it never went away? Yeah, I think it's a, a real ebb and flow of the media. They really get attached to something, and oh, this from November through uh, January of 2006, November 2005 through right now, we have all of these stories from Malaysia of the Bigfoot. Yeah. But you're not hearing anything from Loch Ness. You're hearing maybe there was two or three sightings last summer. There's no very uh, big flamboyant uh, expeditions over there. There's no movies coming out that's talking about the last movie that anybody talks about with Loch Ness was the Werner Herzog, um, you know, mockumentary, which was really a joke called the Incident, Incident at Loch Ness, yeah. which was a spoof. And so as long as you're going to hear that that's the way people are talking about Loch Ness, and, and this whole business about uh, that a few years ago that there was a quote-unquote deathbed c- confession and somebody said that they'd hoped the photograph, even though that person told the story about what he said it was two years before he died. And the reality is that everybody in the Loch Ness field has known that surgeon's photograph wasn't that great to begin with. You know, he was, and one of the reasons that he kept it quiet was because he was up in Scotland having an affair with an assistant. (laughs) So there's all these little back stories that uh, that people, uh, you know, don't know about with any of that stuff yet. Until until it's Loch Ness's time again, it's, it'll kind of be on the back burner. And do you think uh, it's sort of hurt by the fact that it's just in a pocket, sort of, it's just, it's just in that lake? It's not it's not as mysterious as the Bigfoot because it could kind of be anywhere. With the Loch Ness monster, you know it's in Loch Ness, so it's it's there, and, and you can't really, like, mystify it as much? Well, I don't know. I, when I went to Loch Ness in 1999, I felt like I'd finally come to the epicenter of cryptozoology. Oh, really? Here, yeah, here within one block area, you had two whole huge exhibitions on the Loch Ness Monster, and I thought that was amazing. You can't go anywhere without, you know, buying souvenirs or, I mean, seeing souvenirs and seeing people that are very open to it. So Loch Ness and the Loch Ness Monster really have gone hand in hand. I think that uh, when people go there when they find out and start reading about Loch Ness and find out there's enough water in Loch Ness to bury every human being on Earth under six feet of water, then they know that uh, something still could be hiding there. Okay. Uh, Tell me a little bit about Cryptomundo, because this is sort of your new thing. It's been going on since, like, October, I think, right? And uh, everybody's talking about Cryptomundo. I'm not even joking. Uh, When I'm online, I see news links. I see Cryptomundo all the time, so... And you seem to be the brainchild behind that. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, I'm one of the one of the associates contributors. Um, Craig Woolheater in Texas really had this idea, and uh, um, so he's on it he as one of the people, the bloggers. Then there's Rick Knoll, mm-hmm. uh, who is connected with the Skokum cast, and then uh, recently John Kirk has joined from British Columbia. And he's very much interested in lake monsters. And what we're really committed to doing is, uh, is appearing almost daily with some news that nobody else is talking about. And I think yeah. what we saw was, you know, there's always uh, there's there's some good websites like the Anomalist, or and you get uh, you know different people on Boing Boing really publishing some stuff like Dave. But uh, there wasn't one place that we saw. There was lots of forums. There's lots of websites and. And there's lots of um, Yahoo lists. I mean, I'm a member of 40 Yahoo lists. Oh, wow. But uh, I started seeing that my energies, because so many people wanted so much from me that I needed to concentrate and focus a little bit better as opposed to responding to every comment that came. And I was doing that. I've been doing that since uh, since the 80s, trying to – I get 500 emails a day, and I try to return – Answers, but it. Oh man! Uh, in addition to doing all of the media and doing all of writing the books and going yeah. to you know like the Black Forest of Pennsylvania looking for Thunderbird, so I I'm finding that uh, blog and the whole idea of blogging is really a a novel way to exist on the net because you can kind of put one thought out for the day or two or three as I often do and then respond to people that want to respond to that as opposed to going to Searching for conversations or conversations coming to you in individual emails, it's a, it's a much 
more efficient way for me to be a cryptozoologist online. Okay. Um, well, why don't you tell me uh, what's coming up for you in 2006? Well, right now there's, a, uh, like I mentioned, the Creatures of the Outer Edge and the Unidentified were, uh, are going to be republished. The Field Guide to Bigfoot and uh, Mystery Primates is going to come out again in a new edition with a, a whole new index and a great update. Uh, and I'm working on a long-term project, which is a kid's book on cryptozoology. And I, oh, I don't wow. know if I'll finish it this year, but I sure want to try. And then I'm very excited by the whole uh, exhibition that's going to be at Bates College. Uh, we're going to have a, a whole university museum uh, turning into a traveling exhibition. And it's going to have artists from around the world, you know, China, yeah. France, different places, pulling together some of their uh, art that's been inspired by cryptozoology. And coming out with that is going to be a coffee table-sized book oh, wow. with uh, different pieces of art from cryptozoology. And I did an introduction essay on cryptozoology, and there'll be articles in there about cabinets of curiosity and uh, P.T. Barnum and, and uh, cryptozoologist, as well as one on Charles Fort, really talking about how all of the uh, unexplainable things that are connected to cryptozoology has influenced what's really a whole new art form in cryptozoology. So that's a very exciting uh, long-term project, and and I just can't know. You know, tomorrow I get a new call for a new place to go, or yeah. a new animals discovered, or a new show to be on. So it's it, I'm very open and flexible to what the new year is going to bring me. Awesome, awesome. All right, and where can people get the uh uh, all your great cryptozoology books on Amazon and through your website, too? Yeah, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, yeah, and all of those. Obviously, yeah. In the bookstores, just uh, type in Lauren Coleman on mine or on any of those uh, websites. And then my personal website is uh, laurencoleman.com, and then cryptomundo.com can get you to uh, to the daily blog. Now, what's the origin of the name Cryptomundo? Because I really like it. Uh, well, um it's obviously crypto from hidden and yeah. Mundo's world. Uh, one of the, one of the my favorite. Uh, when I graduated from high school in 1965, uh, I don't know if you've ever uh, heard of the movie Mondo Connie. No, no. It's a uh, it's a dog's world, and it was the the theme song from that was the graduating song. But that was one of my favorite movies in '65 because it gave a real overview of a whole bunch of different things. So we just. We took the Mundo from uh, World with uh, the U on it instead of the O, and that worked out pretty well. Awesome. Crypto Mundo, yeah. Okay. Now, I want to move on here to uh, about a year ago, maybe maybe a year and a half ago, I discovered that you are actually also uh, a well-known and very rigorously published uh, sociologist. Is that the correct term, sociologist, with the uh, your series and the copycat effect? Well, I don't have a Ph.D. in sociology or in any other field. Uh, you know, I'm, I've been called anything. I've been called many things, but I, I've been called a social scientist, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a public affairs writer, a suicidologist. I have a degree, uh, as I mentioned, a psychiatric degree uh, in psychiatric social work or clinical social work with a specialty, a subspecialty in uh, child welfare, but I've mostly written and done uh, major million dollar federal projects in the area of suicide prevention and uh, working with law enforcement, working in uh, with adoption and adoptive kids. And, and so uh, when I decided, I wrote in 1987 a book called uh, Suicide Clusters. Yeah. And in my sort of radical 40 and way, I decided uh, that I was kind of tired of all of the academics and suicidologists that was uh, talking that suicide clusters didn't exist. It was kind of, they said, that's a word of the media, and we don't have that as a real phenomena. So what I did was took, uh, you know, my research skills from all of this other work that I do, which you know, goes across every field that I'm really involved with, yeah. and so suicide clusters is a real mystery. I, I don't think that we really know and understand why humans uh, kill themselves and uh, die by suicide. So, but beyond that, people do it actually in clusters. And I was able to backtrack in that book, and then I've uh, 
you know, taken that material, the relevant material, and put it in my new book, The Copycat Effect, and looked at suicides in, in clustering back to the 4th century B.C. Oh, wow. And so suicide clusters has been around a long time. And then what I wanted to do with The Copycat Effect was really look at this whole notion that clustering behavior contagion is a real thing and that the copycat effect does exist, whether it's stories in the newspaper about uh, alligator attacks or shark attacks or the scare that often, uh, and I also talk in, in that book all about how death sells. If you look at the news, it's all about hurricanes and tornadoes and mine disasters and assassinations and terrorism, yeah. and, and you can just go through a half an hour of broadcast news and there's maybe one happy story in there and then you, and it's probably a happy story because somebody survived cancer that was supposed to have killed them yeah. you know so so you look at that and you think well, why why of course people are going to die from homicide and murder suicide suicide because that's the way the whole attention span for human beings is now set up and the copycat effect just takes that beyond that and talks about how people actually copy each other's suicides, friends. Yeah, I, I really enjoy the copycat effect. I was, like, I had never, it's surprising to me that that, uh, that you have these two separate uh, sort of, like, sort of uh, worlds in a way, because I, I had never known that Lauren Coleman, critically acclaimed father of cryptozoology, was also such a, a well-known uh, uh, social writer as well, so I was, I'm really impressed by that. Ah, uh, thank you, thank you. Um, now, how do you sort of uh, juggle those two um, specializations? Do you find that you get a lot of flack at all uh, because of your crypto work when you're in the more mainstream sort of uh, work with the suicide clusters and now the copycat effect, or is it or are they just totally kept separate? Well, it, it's intriguing because on the one hand, um, if you look at my life, I started. I was in school, I was in uh, college, and I decided I needed a job, and I knew I was pretty good working with people, and cryptozoology isn't the kind of thing that ever earns you a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. You know, I have not got my MacArthur grant yet. <laughs> uh, no, there's no money in it. The books, you know, unless you're a, a fiction writer, you get a, maybe get a lot of money for books, but most of my, even though I've written... 27 books, they're all nonfiction. Wow. They, don't, they don't get me a lot of money. So I needed a regular job, so to speak, and that regular job was working with people uh, first uh, front line, you know, in juvenile halls and working in residential treatment and running programs like that, and then working in academia, or, uh, teaching documentary film, teaching social work, anthropology, so that I could at least live and survive as I really did what I was passionate about, which was cryptozoology. But uh, slowly they merged, and it, it's quite obvious that I'm, you know, I can write and I can do research projects, and they kind of combined it. So when I worked, when I moved to um, Portland, Maine in 1983, I got a job at a university doing research full time and then taught a little bit on the side, and it gave me the freedom to do more cryptozoology too. What is funny, of course, is that uh, if you're in academia, that people are going to be, you know, walk around with their noses up oftentimes and say, oh, that's the guy that uh, investigates the little green men. Of course, I've never uh, written a book on UFOs or little green men, but that was the way that people try to ridicule me. And, and it didn't affect me because, I mean, I've been in the field so long that it's pretty hard to, I just take a lot of this with a sense of humor because there's all kinds of silly people in the world and I'm I'm not that silly, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm pretty down to earth about what I look at. In in terms of suicide and all of that, I just got deeper and deeper into that because it became a focus and a a specialty. So much so that when I decided uh in really in the about it was 10 years ago to retire from the university to uh, really look at getting away from academia, I started consulting on the side in suicide prevention and so that I could have at least some stable, even though my income literally is, you know, zeroes out because of my expenses are about there too. Yeah. Um, at least that was a way to pay the mortgage and pay the, the oil bill here in Maine. Yeah. And, uh, and then cryptozoology was on the side. But, and now it's flipped around so that I'm almost seen full-time as cryptozoologist, but I still, 
in, in the, that field of suicide prevention so that, for instance, uh, during the, I think it was the second week of January of 2006, you could pick up a Sports Illustrated and there was a huge story about uh, football suicide clusters. And I'm interviewed in that and across four or six pages, there's quotes from the copycat effect in my books on yeah. suicide. And nobody reading that would know that I'm also a cryptozoologist. So sometimes the twain doesn't meet, but I'm very open these days talking about I think there's a lot of overlap. You you have media flaps in both of them. Yeah. They affect sightings. Uh, it affects the way kids are going to react, either saying they see it, saw a Bigfoot or, unfortunately, for the more vulnerable teens and older people around us, it's, it's in terms of killing themselves. So there's a lot of understanding about interviewing, about manipulation of the media that occurs that I really have taken from both fields to uh, put in copycat effect or in, into my other work about cryptozoology. Why don't, you, uh, why don't you tell me a little bit about these football suicide clusters, because I've never really heard about this before until you really just mentioned it. Well, in my book, The Copycat Effect, I do a whole chapter on baseball player suicides. Uh, in the 1980s, I, did, I was the first person to study uh, the suicides that were occurring in Major League Baseball. And I studied it so much by, that by the spring of 1989, I wrote every uh, Major League manager, uh, CEO, uh, general manager, and uh, also the commissioner of baseball and said that we need to wake up. Statistically, we're going to have some suicides uh, in this year, in 1989, and we need to get some funding. You need to really take a look at the fact that you're not doing anything to prepare some of these baseball players. As it turns out, that was the summer that Donnie Moore shot himself. Oh, wow. Uh, Donnie Moore was the Angels pitcher that gave up the, the final pitch uh, that David Henderson turned into a home run, and the Angels didn't go to the World Series, and the Red Sox did that year, 19. 1986. But he killed himself uh, three years later after he'd gone to the minors, and I'd studied and found out that baseball players had kill, kill themselves within three years of when they retire from Major League Baseball or as an older man. Oh, wow. Um, so that here we had Donnie Moore plus three other baseball players kill themselves that summer. Oh. So I was uh, phenomenally right in my prediction. And baseball, I think it was the next year... Uh, got together the BAT program, which is uh, assistance to a retired baseball players to try to, you know, if somebody falls on bad times or yeah. needs some therapy, they'll get their help. Now, transferring that to what's happening up here in Maine is there's a one city, Winthrop, Maine, and to what, <coughs> excuse me, what, um, what the local people started seeing is that Kids on that football team were moving away. They were graduating from school, moving away, and then over the space of, uh, of three years, five of them had killed themselves. And the only thing they had in common was that they were uh, they were football players. There were all kinds of other risk factors, such as them owning a gun or uh, actually, you know, drinking or yeah. stuff like that. But what we know about suicide is it takes many, many factors. You know, it's not just the breakup with a girlfriend or the loss of a job. It's, it's a bunch of different factors together with teenage impulsiveness. But what the copycat effect says is that most teenagers and, and most adults who, who choose to kill themselves um, do it because the model of suicide has been put in front of them. Um, yeah. And it's not... It's not about if you talk about suicide, you're killing, you know, actually people want to talk to you about suicide because then that keeps them alive. Uh, it's, it's when they're not talking about suicide and they're reading in the media about it or they're hearing through the Internet or IM or, or you know, word of mouth that so-and-so killed themselves. They then think, well, I'm a football player. I'm a young white guy, you know, from a little town in Maine, the same town as this guy. I'm under stress. Maybe... I should do that, too, because suicide is really about getting away from the pain. Yeah. Uh, most kids don't want to die. They just are in incredible pain, uh, whether it's physical or psychological. or For some kids, it could be, you know, a, a bunch of credit card debts. For somebody else, it could be because they're getting kicked off of a sports team. So 
these things mount up and then they don't talk to anybody. And for boys, you can see how that happens. Yeah. Boys tend to hold on to things and keep them inside, whereas uh, young females tend to talk to friends, cry, more attempts, different things like that, and get more of a chance to, to stay alive. Yeah. So the, the football cluster got to be such a thing up there that there's monuments that uh, now they're, they're being, you know, CNN and MSNBC and everybody is circling around now because it was a huge spread in Sports Illustrated. So I don't think it's a, it's quiet yet and we're, we expect to have more media in the state about that. Now, uh, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, the sorrows of young Werther because you sort of point to that as, as pretty easy proof of, of the actual validity of the copycat effect. Yeah, well, the, uh, Young Werner uh, uh, was a, a book, in, a book in which, uh, that was the 1700s, which a man had uh, in the book, and it was a fiction book, by the same guy that did Faust. So it was a famous book in Europe. Uh, he, he never could quite get back to the one woman he loved, so he talks about sitting on a writing table and writing out some words to her and then taking a gun and shooting himself and bleeding on the floor. And he has, on a, I think, a yellow coat and this book and everything. So what started happening is after that book came out, all across Europe, uh, police were finding men that were wearing the same yellow coat. They had the book in front of them. And they were killing themselves. And, and that's very much like... Uh, uh, what we found in uh, 1962 after Marilyn Monroe died. Yeah. Um, young blonde women, usually bleach blonde women, were taking overdoses of uh, pills to such an extent that it increased the suicide rate in the United States for the month after Marilyn Monroe's death by 12%. Oh, wow. Uh, actual number of 197 people over and above the normal rate died and it wasn't the kind of thing that there was a peak and then there's a valley afterwards. But the suicide the phenomena of the copycat effect, you get these clustering and these bumps in the rate, and then it never goes back again. Oh, really? uh, after after uh, Freddie Prince Sr. killed himself with a gun, you had an incredible spike in the Hispanic uh, rate. Young Hispanic men with guns were killing themselves. And it happens over and over again. Uh, when Donnie Moore killed himself uh, very soon after that, a Sacramento Suns uh, basketball player killed himself. So, so you see that, and and what I try, after Kurt Cobain killed himself, seventy people around the world. Uh, what I tried to say is that we we can't let our guard down, and that the media actually not not that they're to blame, they certainly are contributing to the whole notion that. They're creating new suicides, yeah. celebrity suicides that are overblown, that really are not thought about more correctly, that it's not a great thing to do, you know, and there may be some hotline numbers at the bottom of the article. But most of the, the celebrity suicides where they're graphic, they're talked on and on about with talking about the family and how much pain this is head to the family, you get other suicides afterwards because people see it as a quick way out and an end to all of their problems. Yeah. And the, the Hemingway family is a, a great example because here you have five. I did, uh, I was a consultant to NBC News' Unsolved Mysteries episode on on uh, the Hemingway curse. Yeah. And five suicides in that family and it, Margot Hemingway did her suicide 30 years to the exact week and that uh, Ernest Hemingway killed himself. Now, what was the uh, what was the post-publication uh, of the copycat effect? What was the reaction from the media uh, to the book? Oh, well, I've, you know, met with editors and I've had some things and I think the Boston Globe uh, did a review of it and they, they tried to, you know, put it down and I think what has generally happened is they've tried to ignore it because there's media guidelines in there. There's media guidelines from the CDC that I said have not been, that have been ignored for 20 years and I was trying to get people interested in it. Within the suicide world and the suicide prevention world, it's been, uh, you know, applauded, but within the media, their way of killing something, of course, is to just ignore it. Yeah. 
So, uh, you know, I've not exactly been invited on CNN after a series of school shootings, yeah. in which I might want to talk about how one of the reasons that there's school shootings in country is because the media talks about them so much. Yeah. Yeah, well, I can see why they wouldn't want to face the culpability of it and uh, right. would, would sort of bury I've been on I've been on All Things Considered, and I've been on, you know, shows like yours as well as... Uh, Coast to coast and unknown country and places like that, but the, the mainstream media certainly likes to keep away from it. It's only the NPR, the alternative mainstream that, that I've been on. Yeah. Now, uh, in the book, you say that you were kind of worried about uh, reader copycats. Was that something that, that you uh, struggled with when writing the book? You didn't want uh, to sort of put that in the minds of the people that were reading the book, right? Well, I, I certainly wanted to let people know at the end of the book that's something I struggled with because I think that any writer who's talking about writing about suicide might actually lead to other suicides has to consciously think about that. And I, I carefully, you know, chose my stories. And I also, it's, it's sort of the, the antidote against it being a copycat, cat, cat, uh, stimuli is by bringing it up at the end yeah. and so that people can see that they really need to take this book. And anyway, by the time somebody read 320 pages of my book, they'll probably fall asleep before they get it. <laughs> at least I'm hoping so. But, you know, I'm, and, and humor is a very important part of suicide prevention, so I try to make sure in my trainings and talks on that that people really understand that the book is not about death, it's about living. And I feel, I think that by the end, it's opposed to the media, which has rejected it, uh, the ones that have talked about it, have seen that it's really about examining and living. Now, all, now you cover a lot of different sort of um, media flaps in, in the uh, in copycat effect. What was probably the most disturbing of them uh, for you that, you sort of, that was just chilling to you? Well, I, I think what was most chilling when I was in the middle of it, and I, I, you know, like I said, I wrote the book Suicide Clusters in 1986 and 87. And when that was happening, I could see we were really on a peak. Uh, and so what was going to be next? What was going to be next? I kept saying to myself, and I was totally shocked and surprised to see that there was a small period of workplace rampages that got so much publicity. Yeah, and that was when the that was when the media was switching over from really the big three to the big four, to now which is you know the big two hundred and fifty three channels. Yeah, uh, and so you you see now wall to wall news channels that all they needed to do and all they wanted to do was you know we we don't live in California so you can't put car chases on all the time, so they started putting on school shootings, and when the stu school shootings started happening in the nineties. I saw what was happening. As opposed to suicide clusters happening in schools, kids who were parts of those schools uh, were coming in, suicidal kids, and 100% of the school shooters had been suicidal. They were coming into the schools and getting on TV for two years, I mean, for two days. And so it was really about three years before Columbine that this whole phenomenon began. Yeah. And you started seeing it in Arkansas and in Oregon and, you know, little little rural towns that then moved to the suburban towns like Columbine, uh, you know, the Littleton. And I just was I, was, I was shocked and aghast because I could see it happening right before my eyes. And the ultimate evidence that this was really media-driven for me was 9-11. Because as soon as 9-11 happened, school shootings were no longer important because they were no longer important for the whole year after Columbine. We had no school shootings because all the news was reporting on was terrorism, war in Afghanistan, war in Iraq, terrorism, 9-11, 9-11. Yeah. So uh, you didn't have what I think is really the adrenaline-driven media uh, and uh, it just disappeared. It disappeared, and then it started popping up in Germany, in Turkey, and you got massive school shootings that were copying what we'd done in America a year before over there. Yeah. And now it started coming back, you know, the Red Lake, Minnesota, yeah. and uh, the other place in Minnesota that happened a few months before that. So I expect, uh, and this is a prediction that 
I said often in March and April of this year, I think we're going to get a round of school shootings that we haven't really prepared for. Well, why do you say that? Just I think that people have let, around. Yeah, I think that uh, I think that people have let their guard down. And uh, when I did the data and collected it and analyzed it for the last wave, there was two major periods of the year when we're, we're getting school shootings, and that was at the beginning of the school year in September and October, and with the an even bigger peak in uh, March and April, with you know a little overlap into May, but it's at the end of uh, end of the winter, and May is the number one month for suicides in the country for all age groups. Why is that, you think? Uh, I think that's because in the northern hemisphere, uh, suicide is really related to isolation, violence, and homicide turned inward and homicide turned outward. I mean, suicide turned outward as homicide. So I think that uh, people go outside and they see individuals and couples, and they're not in a couple. They're still alone. Their life is still miserable and they end up killing themselves. And so if you look at what happens at school years, and the schools end anywhere from May to June in different parts of the country, uh, people are not going to be happy with what uh, the summer is going to bring and what the school year has left them, and they're going to those, you know, whether it's an excuse about bullies, they're a bully or they have been being bullied, uh, no matter what it is, or a neo-Nazi holiday that may be, uh, you know, underneath it all, like Columbine happened on Hitler's birthday, and Efren, uh, Germany's big suicide that was 22 individuals killed happened on uh, Rudolf Hess's birthday, very much connected to a calendar that uh, I call the Twilight language. All of that's going to happen. Uh, it's going to happen again. Oh, man. Now, uh, like you said, uh, after 9-11, it seemed to be there was uh, less coverage of school shootings and stuff like that. Uh, I seem to have noticed an, up, an uptick in missing person uh, stories. Have you noticed that in the last, like, two or three, four years, uh, an increase in this missing person phenomenon? Yeah, yeah. In my book, I actually talked to uh, a little section I call Abducted by the Media. There was a whole period in there. Uh, the, in which we heard the missing children stories, and, and the Christian Science Monitor did an analysis of them and found out that it was a media-driven phenomenon. That the years before, there actually had been more abductions, more missing kids, but the media wasn't interested in it, and so they were talking about it now. And, and the other thing is the whole stars and you know West Nile and all you know yeah. there's pan epidemics that the whole world's going to die off with millions of people. We're beginning to notice almost every summer now there's a new disease that we're all going to die from. Yeah. And uh, you know right now it's the bird flu that we all should get ready to fund uh, the government for all of the vaccines that they want to make. So you know we're it's it's a media driven it's a scared fear driven culture that uh, we're living in right now and. Uh, whether it's abducting, you know, kids that are being abducted or right now the stories are all about mine disasters. You know, yeah. people die in mine work all the time. When they should be safe. I'm not dismissing that. But you really have to look at the media uh, just gets into their three-day and nine-day wonders. Yeah. And they go wild with it. I mean, people are seeing Bigfoot all the time. But you hear about one story and then... Over in Malaysia right now, you would think they're seeing Bigfoot every other day. They had they had one sighting last November, and we're still hearing about it because it becomes a fascination with the media. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, what about uh, fictional type stories and their influence on uh, on society as a whole? I mean, that's a huge debate. Um, do you think the copycat effect is not just limited to news coverage, but also to uh, fiction, like movie and TV shows? I think to a certain extent, if you read closely my chapter on school shootings in the, the copycat effect, what I talk about is that uh, three or four of those individuals had the Stephen King's book, The Rage, yeah. a rage in their lockers that they'd been reading it. And The Rage was about a school shooting in which a guy goes into an algebra class and shoots the teacher and then shoots some students. Well, one of the first people that did a school shooting went into an algebra class and um, shot the algebra teacher in the back of the head, killed her, and then killed a couple kids, and then turned around and uh, quoted from Stephen King's book, The Rage. And that happened two, three years before Columbine, 
So that after Columbine, Stephen King went on the Today Show and said that uh, he, he vis- you know, physically is kind of ill because of what he might have written in The Rage. And The Rage, or Rage is one of the, is the only Stephen King book that he's pulled from publications. And so he certainly knew the link, and he knew that the kids were reading this book and getting the ideas and, and really turning turning his art into action. Now, how long ago did he uh, publish The Rage in the first place? Well, it, was a, it came out in the 70s. Was but, there any sort of violence after it uh, back then? Uh, supposedly, he had based it upon uh, a real-life incident, and then it, it had a little, a little uh, bit of copycat. But I think it's... It's really the mass media, the intersection between a fictional novel, the Internet, and uh, cable television that really all came together in the 90s for that book. And um, now I kind of heard this uh, sort of funky theory that uh, as soon as I heard it, I was like, I've got to ask Lauren Coleman about this, this theory that someone had. And that was uh, last year you saw a lot of stories about teachers having sex with their students. And they blamed it on uh, the Desperate Housewives show. Do you think there's much credence to this uh, plucky little theory? It's not mine, uh, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I don't think that the timing of that is quite correct. I believe the stories about uh, people having sex with their teacher and even that, the one in New Hampshire where she got her student to kill her husband yeah. happened many years before a Desperate Housewives. That's sort of like in my book, Mysterious America, I talk about the phantom clown scare that happened in the Boston area and also with in uh, Omaha and Kansas and different places like that around New England. That happened in 1981, and a lot of people said that um, that, that was caused by Stephen King's book, The It, but The It was, or it was uh, published afterwards. So sometimes, you know, these theories need time travel machines. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, what did you see uh, for the past year uh, for trends that might have come up? Uh, like you said, do you think there'll be a rash of school shootings later on this year in March, April? Yeah, um, well, well, two summers ago I, I wrote about uh, and talked about uh, in some, some different places I lectured or wrote uh, about how beheadings was definitely connected to copycat. Uh, you, you didn't see... Uh, you, you know, there's been beheadings used in Islamic cultures for a long time, but their use in terrorist activities only started to take off after the media started telling us all about them yeah. so much. And so I definitely saw that as a copycat phenomenon. I think the school shootings are definitely a copycat phenomenon that's carrying on. And right now, uh, you know, it's, it's once again uh, something related to death, and I think the mind deaths are, are what the the media is focusing on, uh, you know, at least to talk about whether or not it, uh, whether or not we're going to get some more killings of journalists or something like that. Because every time the media focuses on something, it tends to be used either by the homicidal or the suicidal part of our culture to really replicate it. Now, do you find these sort of trends, um, do they build to a peak, or do they sort of start at the peak and then get subsequent coverage of uh, smaller stories down the line? Well, once again, I, I, I point to the media. If you look at the media, they get bored with things. And once they get bored with things, those individuals then move on to something else. Yeah. And they start uh, going away from that. So uh, you, you certainly see that happen with the news. Um, it just builds the beheadings became so commonplace that there wasn't a lot of reporting on them, so the terrorists decided to not use that tactic. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it happens, too, uh, one of the prevention ways in suicide, uh, prevention around suicide clusters, is to get control of your local media, not to, not to publish graphic details, to not even really mention it. And a lot of papers around the country, as opposed to even using the word suicide in an article, uh, in a, I mean, in obituaries, you read them very carefully, and they say so and so died unexpectedly at their home on Tuesday. Yeah. You don't know if that's you know they died of a heart attack or suicide, but it's most oftentimes a suicide. Did you find much of an increase after the Hunter S. Thompson suicide uh, last February? No, I think the media roundly uh, 
you know, criticized that and made that into a joke uh, so much so that the other thing is you need a population of people that can identify with a person killing themselves. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Marilyn Monroe, uh, Freddie Prince, uh, a young person like Kurt Cobain, you got people that were fans and were identified. Most people who might have liked Hunter Thompson were probably already out of their head on alcohol anyway, or, you know, or were, had the gonzo kind of lifestyle that they sure wasn't going to do what he was going to do. So it, it's not, it's not something that's overly identified. When I, when I looked into and wrote about the Heaven's Gate people, it was the same sort of thing. Yeah. There was a small collection of individuals around Heaven's Gate that did kill themselves, but beyond that, the Heaven's Gate cult was so self-identified as quote-unquote crazy that not many people would identify that they wanted to be like those people. Yeah, so it requires like a like a devoted fan base. Or a fan base or a strict identification. So like in a small community, if you have all football players that are all males and young, they can identify with each other. Yeah. Uh, and across the country... Uh, you know, baseball fans or something of, if like Ken Griffey Jr. killed himself, you'd, you'd have his devoted fans maybe, you know, deciding they wanted to pick that method to die. And, um, like in the book, you, uh, you speak to, uh, sort of the change in vernacular as far as, uh, the term suicide and then, um, like com- uh, completed. Is that the, the, like, well, how do you explain a little well, bit about the vernacular that? The, the, I, the language of suicide, especially as you're working with kids, and is something for 20 years I've tried to have the media. If you can imagine, uh, we're, we want to use the word successful with everybody. You're successful in a relationship, in a job, yeah. in your career, in sports, even if you're an athlete uh, or a student athlete, successful in your grades and your dating. But then for a newspaper to say there were three successful suicides in Omaha this weekend and or uh, Joe Blow had another failed attempt uh, or you know I picked up a newspaper once and it said uh, Newton Massachusetts young man fails an attempt to hang himself in front of church the whole underlying message that is saying to kids is well you failed so you got to keep trying until you succeed yeah and that we don't like the use of the word succeed, we don't like the use of the word, word failed because it gives teenagers the wrong message. Um, some people don't like completed suicide because they think, once again, you got to keep doing it until it's completed. Yeah. And other people don't like the word committed suicide because that really go back goes back to that it was an act uh, that sometimes was punished by being committed to a mental hospital or committed yeah. to jail. Well what, well, what do you prefer then for vernacular of that? I just say die by suicide, kill themselves. I'm very straightforward. This is this is about death. It's just like dying from leukemia or uh, you know a car wreck or something else. You're you're dead, and uh, there may be some choice to it. But a lot of people make choice about having lung cancer or you know eating too many uh, donuts and other different things that people are almost parasuicidal. You know, having unsafe sex and different things. So that's what we talk about, how there's a lot of different choices that people are really uh, just as much making choices, and yet we don't put kind of a uh, a shame and sanction on that. So we need to really look at suicide differently. And and um, sort of like kind of to wrap it up, we're heading right to the end here. Do you, uh, do you find yourself when you're watching the news uh, on edge now um, when you see stories because you're like, because I find after I... I read the book. I found myself watching the news, and then I'd be like, "Oh man, I hope, I hope people aren't going to copy that." And the one I think of is uh, this kid that went to Iraq over uh, Christmas. I was like, "Oh no, now crazy kids everywhere are going to try and take, uh, you know, secretive trips somewhere. It's going to, it's going to get ugly." Yeah. Well, I've never. I mean, uh, since I've been teaching about the media for thirty years now, it doesn't put me on. And, and especially stories like that that have a high barrier to to uh, really making happen. Yeah, it's it's much more the the stories uh, in the local newspaper on the local news and sometimes the national news. It's about 
really the kid next door who's taken a, his grandfather's gun and shot up his family and then killed himself. Yeah. I, I'm much more worried about that, especially if they then interview all the neighbors and they say, well, he was a wonderful boy. He was just, we never saw this coming. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. So, um, so, yeah, you think that's sort of, well, like, like what you're saying is it puts into the mind of the viewer that, that that is an option. That is and an option. That's a possibility. And that's what causes the problems. Right. And uh, and we know, you know, that definitely those kids that are doing school shootings are suicidal, so they decide to turn their, their suicidal acts outward, and it's had a very lethal uh, outcome. Now, it sounds like you've done a lot of research on the school shootings. What do you think about the... Um the whole medicated uh, student situation where it seems like a lot of the kids that are doing the school shootings are on medication, or is that just another sort of um, overblown uh, statistic type of thing? Well, that's definitely uh, getting the theories mixed up. And, you you know, I've talked, to, of course, if a kid's depressed or they're suicidal, they're going to be on medication. It's not so much the medication that's causing the, you know, the school shooting. They were already in such a vulnerable state that then they were put on the medication because you you have many people that aren't on a medication that are depressed or despondent or homicidal that then turn into suicide or the reverse. That It's just, that's very bad. Uh, that's sort of pop psychology that the media often picks up on. Yeah. I don't see a real connection there. Okay. Um, what do you see for 2006 for yourself in, in this realm of research? Well, I I think I'm slowly, uh, you know, deciding that uh, the media is not waking up about this. I get very, uh, very upset and disillusioned sometimes. I, you know, spend years writing a book like The Copycat Effect and to find out that nobody is reading it. It's, you can't even, you know, get off the Amazon charts out of the out of the 100, you know, 100,000, it depresses me that uh, the media really doesn't take a, a book like this, but the research that definitely shows there's a, a cause and effect and doesn't apply it to their lives. I'm just hoping sometime, someplace, there will be a tipping effect and that maybe the media will wake up to how they're involved in, in actually creating tomorrow's headlines. And do you think there will be a, a tipping effect, or you don't really... Uh... Well, I don't know if I'll be around to see it. <laughs> <laughs> do you think the effect of the 24-hour news has uh, made it worse? Oh, definitely. I think that there's so much that needs to be put on there. And, uh, you know, I, I have I still have relatives in California. I still see what happens with car chases out there. And every time there's a big story, it just it overwhelms all of the news channels and so no, we're hearing about nothing good and everything bad. And, uh, you know, we, as I put in my book, there's documented cases of finding people who have sat in front of their TV for hours and then they go out and they go into a cafeteria and kill 12 people. So uh, it does have a, a direct effect. Yeah. And where can uh, people pick up The Copycat Effect or Suicide Clusters or any of the other uh, books well, on this realm? Suicide Clusters is out of print, but Copycat oh, Effect is uh, online, you know, through Amazon.com and Barnes and & Noble and any bookstores. It's a, it's a Simon & Schuster book. Okay, and they can find uh, more information in that in that area of your expertise at laurencoleman.com as well. Yeah, I do have a link to that book here. Uh, there's also a, a, a site that I've created called thecopycateffect.com. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much, Lauren Coleman, for this awesome interview and, and time to speak with you. We covered a lot of ground, not just cryptozoology, but uh, sociology and media and all that. And just you're a real renaissance man, top of the field in crypto, and obviously you know your stuff here in the media. So thank you so much for the interview. You're welcome, Tim. It was great talking to you on this sunny but uh, snowy day. That does it for this week's edition of Been All of America Audio. I want to thank Lauren Coleman for giving us so much time and covering so much ground with us. It was a real treat to have him on the show. I want to thank John Renault, who gave us the theme music for this week's edition of Manola of America Audio. I actually happen to have gone to college with Johnny, Johnny Renault, and I just loved this song, and I wanted to use it as a theme song this week. Uh, I suggest you all check out Johnny's website, www.johnreno.com. And that's J-O-H-N hyphen R-E-N-A-U-D dot com. He's got music. He's an artist. Uh, check out his stuff. 
Also, I want to thank Leslie, Chiron, and R. Lee of BenAllOfAmerica.com. Check out their columns at BenAllOfAmerica.com, Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays. Those three days, we offer you a slice of esoteric pie that you really can only get at BenAllOfAmerica.com. You're going to love it. Check those out. You heard a little bit, kind of, from Leslie and Chiron this week. Now come back to BenAllOfAmerica.com later in the week, Tuesday for Leslie, Wednesday for Chiron, and check out their columns. Leslie has Gray Matters. Chiron is the K-Files. And also on Mondays, we have R. Lee's Trickster's Realm. Her columns are getting picked up all over the place, really uh, really making waves in the esoteric world, so we're really happy to have R. Lee on board at BenAllOfAmerica.com. Thanks to Leslie, Chiron, and R. Lee for your help and support with the website and the audio series. Big thanks to all the great listeners out there who have found BenAllOfAmerica.com. Thanks to all the websites and the blogs who have linked up to us. Thanks to all the new people who are checking out the show for the first time because they saw the Lauren Coleman interview and they wanted to find out what he had to say. I hope you liked the show. Check out our archives at BenAllOfAmerica.com. We've got tons of interviews with great esoteric minds and many, many more coming down the line with some huge names you're not going to believe. If you're a longtime listener of Ben All of America Audio, feel free to click the PayPal button. Throw some change in the bucket. We're not looking for any serious donations. We're just looking to help get by and offset the cost of producing the show. If you can help out, if you have the money, throw some change in the bucket. We'd appreciate it. That's the PayPal button at BenAllOfAmerica.com. You can find the columns. You can find the audio archives. You can find the PayPal button, all that, at BenAllOfAmerica.com. And that is B-I-N-N-A-L-L of America.com. All one word. Next week, Jerry E. Smith, part one of two. Jerry is the co-author of Secrets of the Holy Lance. We're going to discuss in depth the Spear of Destiny, also known as the Spear of Longinus. We trace the history of this infamous esoteric item from the Passion all the way up to Hitler and World War II and all the various factions and rulers who managed to get a hold of it along the way. We're going to discuss various esoteric aspects of the Spear, the present-day Spear in Austria, and if it is the real one, relics in general, and tons more. It's an enlightening discussion on an often overlooked esoteric realm. It's the Holy Lance. It's the Secrets of the Holy Lance with Jerry E. Smith. Next week on Banal of America Audio, check it out. That will be online March 4th, 2006. Until you hear from me then, thanks for listening. I'm Tim Banal, signing off.